Good morning, nice to see you all. I hope you're staying safe and well. Welcome back to part 11 of our series of lessons on chapter 10 of Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, we are looking at a very important passage today from chapter 10. We're towards the end of the novel. Um, we're looking at a chapter in which Hyde is on his way to Lanyon's house to pick up his drugs. Uh, we're going to be focusing on three different things. Number one, we're going to be focusing on Jekyll as an unreliable narrator, and I'll be arguing about or arguing the case as to why he is, which I have been doing in previous lessons. Number two, we're going to look at how Hyde is presented both by Jekyll and by Stevenson, the writer. And number three, we're going to be looking at the relationship and the dynamic between Jekyll and Hyde and the ongoing battle, as it were, that's raging within Dr. Henry Jekyll uh, and the balance of his nature, as he puts it. So let's start by having a look at the key passage and then we'll have a close reading. Okay, I'm going to start reading from the line, I gnashed my teeth. So he's describing how he treats the driver on his way to Lanyon's house. Yeah, he's on his way to Lanyon's house, if you remember, from chapter 9 uh, to pick up his drugs and to perform his transformation in front of his friend and rival, Dr. Hasty Lanyon. So I'm going to start from here. I gnashed my teeth upon him with a gust of devilish fury and the smile withered from his face. Happily for him, yet more happily for myself, for in another instant I had certainly dragged him from his perch. At the inn, as I, as I entered, I looked about me with so black a countenance as made the attendants tremble. Not a look did they exchange in my presence, but obsequiously took my orders, led me to a private room, and brought me wherewithal to write. To write. Hide in danger of his life was a creature new to me, shaken with inordinate anger, strung to the pitch of murder, lusting to inflict pain. Yet the creature was astute mastered his fury with a great effort of the will, composed his two important letters, one to Lanyon and one to Paul, and that he might receive actual evidence of their being posted, sent them out with directions that they should be registered. Thenceforth he sat all day over the fire in the private room, gnawing his nails where he dined, sitting alone with his fears, the waiter visibly quailing before his eyes. And thence, when the night was finally come, he set forth in the corner of a closed cab and was driven to and fro about the streets of the city. He... I say, I cannot say I. That child of hell had nothing human, nothing lived in him but fear and hatred. And when at last, thinking the driver had begun to grow suspicious, he discharged the cab and ventured on foot, attired in his misfitting clothes, an object marked out for observation, into the midst of the nocturnal passengers. These two base passions raised within him like a tempest. He walked fast, hunted by his fears, chattering to himself, skulking through the less frequented thoroughfares counting the minutes that still divided him from midnight. Once, a woman spoke to him, offering, I think, a box of lights. He smote her in the face, and she fled. When I came to myself at Lanyon's, the horror of my old friend perhaps affected me somewhat. I do not know. It was at least but a drop in the sea to the abhorrence with which I looked back upon these hours. A change had come over me. It was no longer the fear of the gallows. It was the horror of being Hyde that racked me. I received Lanyon's condemnation partly in a dream. It was partly in a dream that I came home to my own house and got into bed. I slept after the prostration of the day with a stringent and profound slumber, which not even the nightmares that wrung me could avail me to break. I awoke in the morning shaken, weakened but refreshed. I still hated and feared the thought of the brute that slept within me, and I had not of course forgotten the appalling dangers of the day before, but I was once more at home, in my own house and close to my drugs and gratitude for my escape shone so strong in my soul that it almost rivaled the brightness of hope. So I said I want to discuss three things, and those three things, just to remind you, were Jekyll as an unreliable narrator, Hyde and how he's presented, and then the relationship or the power dynamic between the two, between Jekyll and Hyde. And we'll, we'll, we'll cover those three areas as we go through this passage in our close reading. We actually start with a description of Hyde which is more or less um, something that we would, we're, now, we're now almost used to as we, get our, as, as we make our way through this novel. Uh, we start with the quote, I gnashed my teeth upon him with a gust of devilish fury. Uh, we, uh, by this point in the novel, you are familiar with the use of animalistic verbs that, that are used to describe Hyde throughout this novel. And here, gnashed is no different. We've seen him have a savage laugh. We've seen him have a gr grinding his teeth, and now he's gnashing his teeth. Um, he's often described in terms that we would associate with beasts, with creatures, with predators. Um, we're also, by this point, used to 
the comparison of Hyde to Satan, to a demon. And it's not, it's not surprising now that he's described as having a gust of devilish fury. Um, and Hyde, throughout this novel, has been compared to various animals, particularly to, to apes, but also to rats, to, um, to kind of predatorial animals as well. We then have a description of Hyde that is somewhat different, and it's the fact that Hyde, now that he's living in fear, now that he fears for his life because of the crime he committed, the murder of Carew, um, he's now having to behave in a manner that is not in line and not the same as how he was behaving early in the novel. Early in the novel, he was self-obsessed, completely selfish, driven to gratify every evil impulse. And, and as Jekyll himself put it, his entire being... Uh, centered entirely on the self. That's, an, that's a direct quote. And now, essentially, he has to show more trepidation. He has to be more careful, he has to be more cautious. And the, the description of his psychological change is interesting as well. Jekyll writes, or rather Stevenson writes, Hyde was in danger of his life, a creature new to me, shaken with inordinate anger, strung to the pitch of murder, lusting to inflict pain. So there's this kind of idea that on the one hand, we have the familiar use of language like creature used to describe Hyde, which kind of links to our description of the, or links to the description of him gnashing his teeth. But we also have this idea that Hyde, although we thought he was merely, you know, Jack Jekyll's selfish impulses, Hyde does have some degree of what we might describe as executive function or, you know, uh, impulse control. I'll put, in, I'll put impulse control because he doesn't merely uh, seek freedom and vent his frustration. He doesn't uh, go out there and gratify all of his pleasures and all of his desires. He's careful uh, and astute, which is interesting because, again, remember that Hyde is, of course, wanted. He's wanted for the murder of Carew. But the fact that he's able to be astute, the fact that he's able to be cautious, he's able to, to show and demonstrate reasoning, perhaps, again, it serves to remind the reader that, of course, Hyde is part of Jekyll. So Jekyll, in, in, some, sense, in some senses, is able to subdue Hyde for his own benefit. Because, of course, Jekyll would like to re retain Hyde and retain the power to transform uh, in the future because it gives him that freedom to indulge his appetites. But Hyde has previously been described as a kind of whirlwind of chaos, uh, a, 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 an impulse-driven, reckless creature. Now that's been tempered. Now he's having to act in a way that is different. Um, and yet, it, supposedly with great effort of will. And we'll talk about this later on when we look at the unreliable narrator aspects of it as well. What's still important, though, is we, we don't forget that Hyde is wholly evil and wholly wicked, so it's not surprising that he's lusting to inflict pain. Uh, and this idea that Hyde is sadistic, someone who enjoys inflicting pain on others, is, again, not surprising to us at this point. It's having read through the entire novel, he's described in this way many, many times previously. We then have the description of Hyde brooding in his private room. And even then, in his private room, he's described in a, a way that is uh, satanic and animalistic, and perhaps in a more subtle way through the use of symbolic gestures and, and uh, symbolism. Firstly, the symbolic gestures. We have the gnawing his nails. Obviously, we associate that with anxiety and fear, but I think there's also, just in that, in that word choice of gnawing, there's that animalistic connotation, this idea of Hyde Again, earlier he was gnashing, now he's gnawing. This idea of Hyde being a wild beast permeates once again. And the more subtle symbol that, that for me, uh, reflects his demonic nature is the fact that he sat over the fire. And the fire I've talked about as a recurring symbol in this novel, that actually Jekyll and other characters often sat before the fire as well, but I think the fire in this sense represents damnation, represents the fires of hell. Uh, so I think it's an ominous uh, use of symbolism from Mr. Stevenson. That idea of him being demonic and, and satanic is reiterated in the description, or the, rather the metaphor, of that child of hell, which again, is a, it's at this point, it's what we would call a recurring 
metaphor because it's come it's come through many many times uh, that Hyde has been called the prodigy of Satan earlier in chapter nine. Uh, he's often compared to the devil or compared to one of the devil's minions, and here's another example of that. Uh, and it just reiterates one of the core themes of the novel, which is of course good and evil and morality. And we've and it's you know that it might be the the most obvious way of reading this allegory, but it's a perfectly valid interpretation that you know Hyde represents the devil within all of us. And I think that's it's not surprising that we we've, we've had so many references to Hyde being a devil or a demon. So this time it's the child of hell. We then have the most interesting section of the passage when it comes to the presentation of Hyde. And that is his Stevenson's description of Hyde walking down the less frequented thoroughfares. And we talked about how one can read this novel and make interpretations about the allegorical nature of this novel. And here I think what Stevenson is hinting at is Hyde representing the moral, the morally insane or moral insanity. This is a kind of pseudo-scientific belief that Victorians had. Uh, so the Victorians would refer to someone who, as being morally insane um, if they had a certain intellectual impairment or uh, you know, if, if they had delusions, but also if they were just generally considered to be kind of abnormal and someone who uh, deviated from social norms. So moral, moral insanity uh, was a label applied to people who were not necessarily, who would not necessarily nowadays be classified as insane, but who did not hold up or whose behavior did not uh, bear up to the standards set by the Victorians. I think there's also a clear reference here to lunacy and madness, and we've talked about Hyde being, uh, you know, potentially being read as the inner madman or the inner lunatic within all of us as well. And that's one of the fantastic things about this novel is that you can read it in so many different ways. But I think the fact that he's, the way he's described to, he's walking fast, he's hunted by fears, and particularly chattering to himself. Uh, these descriptions are almost kind of stereotypical in terms of the trope of the, the madman or the madwoman in literature. And here, clearly, Hyde is morally, uh, not morally, is mentally unstable, is unhinged. Uh, and although now attitudes have changed towards those who suffer from mental health problems, particularly you know, schizophrenics or people who suffer from personality disorder, in this scene, Stevenson, I think, is playing on mental uh, disorders in order to create a sense of fear and horror, in order to f further em em emphasise the idea that Hyde is a terrifying beast. And again, he's using that, uh, I, I think he's using the mental disorder as a means of uh, creating a, this gothic monster that, that is Mr. Edward Hyde. So... Even if, so, in, in his posture, in his descriptions, and in, in the fact that he's chattering to himself, this idea of lunacy is used uh, to create fear. So I'll, I'll put create fear. Um, we then have this very bizarre encounter, and it's the last thing I'll say about Hyde before we move on to uh, the other parts, the other two points I wanted to talk about in this close reading. And that is the scene in which he meets this poor woman. It says, Once a woman spoke to him, offering, I think, a box of lights. He smote her in the face and then she fled. And this is a terrible act of violence. Uh, you know, and it's completely uh, unjustified. It's an act of violence for violence's own sake. It is unprovoked. It is completely amoral. And it goes again to reiterate the idea that Hyde is someone with, with no conscience, with no sense of morality whatsoever. Um, and someone who clearly, and it goes back, I suppose, all the way to this line here, lusting to inflict pain. He is someone who enjoys inflicting pain. He's a, he's a sadist. He's someone who enjoys uh, hurting others. He gets great gratification from acts of violence. Um, and it's a really shocking scene. It's the, it's the third act of horrendous violence that we've actually been witness to in the novel. Let me remind you of the other two. We had the moment in chapter one when he tramples calmly over a little girl. 
We had the murder where he beats Danvers crew with ape-like fury until the bones shatter audibly. Those are all quotes, by the way. And now we have he smote her in the face. What connects those three things besides there being acts of terrible violence is the fact that our gothic monster, Mr. Edward Hyde, uh, he chooses victims or he preys upon victims that are vulnerable. You know, two, a little girl now, a woman who, who's uh, vulnerable and an elderly gentleman, all of whom are, who in the, in the Victorian period would have been perceived as vulnerable and um, fragile in com comparison to the creature that is Edward Hyde. So he chooses innocent victims and that's typical of the Gothic, of, of the Gothic as a, as a, as a, as a genre. Uh, Gothic monster often preys on the innocent and on the vulnerable. Okay, so that's how Hyde is presented in this passage. Let's take a checkpoint before we consider uh, Jekyll as an unreliable narrator and the relationship between the two characters. We have reached our first checkpoint. Uh, suggested timings are on the screen. Please read the questions carefully and respond to them in full sentences. If you need help or you need more time, feel free to take it. I would recommend rewinding and re-watching certain sections of the video before answering the questions. See you shortly. Please now pause the video. Welcome back. I now want to discuss the idea of Jekyll as being an unreliable narrator in chapter 10. I think just to bring us back and try and step back a bit and see the bigger picture, we have to remember the narrative structure that Stevenson has used here. We have to remember that ostensibly we are supposed to be reading this with Dr. Utterson. So remember chapter 8 leaves with Dr. Utterson heading home trudging home to read the two documents in his safe. One, Lanyon's narrative, two, chapter 10. And I think we have to remember that, Jack, that Jekyll is writing, his, in, his intended reader is Utterson, and he's, intended, he, he's intending to, I would argue, keep uh, this discovery and this experiment a secret. I don't think he would want Utterson to reveal the terrible deeds that he's committed. I don't think he'd want him to ruin his reputation even you know, in a posthumous way, even after death. Uh, why do I think this? Well, remember, Utterson is the one to whom Jekyll leaves his fortune. So I, you could read it as a, as a set case of, uh, of bribery. You, you could read it as merely being the final decent gesture of a, of a friend. Uh, I tend to be more cynical about it. I tend to think that he would, he, he would prefer for Utterson to simply read this document uh, sympathise with him and then close it up and put it back in the safe. I think Jekyll is, in writing chapter 10, uh, Jekyll is trying to seek some degree of sympathy, some degree of understanding, uh, and I think he's trying to bind his friend Utterson to secrecy, but of course it's completely open to interpretation. You can, you can and I'm sure will, in some cases, disagree with me about this. Whether or not he is as he is doing, as, I just, as I've just said, I think it is clear that he's trying to deflect some of the culpability. That, by that I mean some of the blame, some of the guilt that lies on his shoulders. And that is just evident. And I've, I, I've chosen this image because it just reminds us again and again and again that Hyde and Jekyll are the same person, that Hyde dwells within Jekyll. He's merely an alter ego, a name for the evil part of Jekyll. So therefore, by that logical extension, therefore, Hyde is Jekyll. So it's troubling, and I would say it, is, it, it creates suspicion that Jekyll refers to Hyde in the third person constantly as though he were a separate person, as though he were not himself. And I think this is misleading, and I think it's deliberately misleading, and I think it is used to deflect blame, as I said. Uh, particularly, let's have a look at a couple of examples in this passage. He says... Hyde and danger of his life was a creature new to me, as though he doesn't understand his own personality. I find that, uh, frankly, uh, you know, dubious to say the least. 
Perhaps the most crucial sentence is when he says, he, I say, I cannot say I. Fascinating uh, use of uh, a short but very in insightful sentence here. I'll read it again. He, comma, I say, dash, I cannot say I. And of course, we should be thinking and pausing on this line and thinking, well, why, why can't you say I? Because, of course, the Je Jekyll is Hyde. Hyde is Jekyll. He is part of Jekyll's I. He is part of Jekyll's identity. And the fact that Jekyll cannot say that he is, for me, is an example of Jekyll trying to deflect uh, and trying to evade guilt and evade responsibility. I think it's really interesting that he's denying Hyde is part of who he is. But considering that's the whole point of the experiment was to allow this evil part of himself to uh, indulge its appetites and its desires. And it's clearly a part of him. That's the whole point of the experiment. That's what the experiment achieves. The experiment achieves essentially a disguise for, Mr. for Dr. Jekyll. He can use the disguise of Hyde to do all of the terrible things he's always longed to do. So now he's denying that part of himself is it creates suspicion for, for sure. The final part I would like to talk about in terms of Jekyll as an unreliable narrator it links to this description of, you know, um, that line, he I say, I cannot say I. And that's in his account of the transformation scene. He does not go into great detail at all in, the uh, in his account of the transformation scene, given if you think about how much detail we saw uh, in Lanyon's account. And he repeats a certain phrase. That I find again creates suspicion for me, and I, I believe links to his intention to try and pacify and try and persuade his friend Utterson to drop this after his death. And he repeats the phrase in a dream. He says, I received Lanyon's condemnation partly in a dream, it was partly in a dream that I came home to my own house. And again, this for me distances Jekyll from his actions. Remember, he is Hyde, so he chose as Hyde, even though that's. That's just the name for another part of, his, of himself. He chose as Hyde to perform the experiment in front of his friend Lanyon because he wanted to get one over on him. He wanted to boast and to brag and to humiliate his rival. So the fact that he declares, oh, it was in a dream that I received the condemnation. It was in a dream that I came back to my house. It makes it feel as though he's not in control of his own actions. And that's what, that's what you know, being in a dream feels like. Sometimes you're not in control of your own actions or you can't perform certain tasks. You, know, you sometimes feel, that you're, feel like you're moving through sludge if you're trying to run. I'm sure we've all experienced that in our dreams. And by referring to it as though it were a dreamlike, uh, you know, he was in a dreamlike state of mind. Again, it, for me, it distances him from the actions that he chose to take as Hyde, even, you know, and, and of course Hyde is him, so really he chose to do these things himself. This links quite nicely to Jekyll's descriptions of Hyde and my final point that I want to talk about, which is the relationship between the two and their ongoing struggle, you know, good versus evil, which is again at the heart of this allegory. And clearly there's a much greater sense of fear and horror in Jekyll's account and in terms of his feelings towards his alter ego. He, he, he says, it was no longer the fear of the gallows, it was the horror of being Hyde that racked me. So he's tortured, uh, that's what he means by racked, think about the kind of uh, being, being stretched out on a rack in a medieval fashion. It's the fear of being Hyde that is what tortures him, supposedly if, if we believe what he's saying. It's the fact that he's slowly converting and transforming into Hyde. It's as though the metamorphosis, the transformation that was, you know, uh, that could be switched round. Either, you know, he could go from Jekyll into Hyde and Hyde into Jekyll. It's, th it's that metamorphosis becoming permanent. He's, he's slowly losing his better self. That is supposedly what's causing him torture. And he claims here in the most memorable line, uh, I still hated and feared the thought of the brute that slept within me. And it's a really, graphic uh, and gothic description. This idea that there is a monster dwelling within. It's the internal gothic monster. Um, and if you go back to our lessons about the gothic and about gothic monsters, the monster often it dwells between the, you know, the, the eye and the other. And here the monster actually sleeps within 
Jekyll. It's almost like a, if you've seen the film Alien, it's almost like that scene from Alien where the alien explodes from the stomach of its victim. But the personification of Hyde as an evil force living and sleeping within Jekyll is quite grim, quite gruesome. It it's just reiterates this idea that they are bound together in some senses. But also there's, this, again, the sexual aspects of it, this idea of him, him and Jekyll being like man and wife, uh, which is a recurring idea that runs throughout the novel, this idea of them being particularly intimate. Uh, and it re reminds us of the kind of, essentially the plot device used by, by Stevenson earlier in the form of the key that for me, which I said in chapter one, represented the, the, an intimacy in their relationship. The fact that as a first time reader, you might think that they were uh, in, an intimate couple, a homosexual couple. But it's a really graphic and gothic uh, description. Um, it captures the nature of the experiment quite nicely in a sense as well, because he's allowed the, the unconscious part of his mind that sleeps within him to be released as well. Uh, and what we'll look at in the next lesson is the use of metaphors to try and explain the relationship between Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, and they become more and more Freudian in a sense, more and more sordid, more and more uh, strange and uh, surreal in a sense. So that brings us to the end of today's lesson. Uh, before you go, here is your final checkpoint.